Okay. All right. If you could open in your Bibles to Romans. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and we're just going to read verses 1 and 2. All right. All right, start with verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, what a simple portion of Scripture. And I could have went on, but I think there's a lot right there. The fact that we're justified by faith, the fact that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, the fact that we have access in, by faith into grace. I mean, wherein we stand. And when we stand, we, we don't shuffle when we stand. We don't move when we stand. We stand. We have access by faith into grace. And we stand in grace. So we have to understand that's our position, is our position is in grace when we come into uh, the Lord Jesus Christ when we're saved. But I, I have found in my walk that grace is a funny thing. And I have found that I, it's a topic that I have to re-revisit all the time, that I have to come back to, that I have to uh, cultivate grace in my life, that I have to understand how grace works in my life because so quickly uh, our mind will sway from grace. Uh, it baffles our minds. It's hard to comprehend true grace. Some say that grace is applied to everyone. And the truth is it's not really applied to everyone. It is offered to everyone. But it's unbelievable that some people don't accept the grace of God. And I think after we accept it, those who have accepted it, uh, it, it takes a lifetime trying to understand the fullness of God's grace. What does it really mean? Uh, what is it doing for us? How do we live understanding it and living inside of it? But a lot of people grapple with grace. And uh, the reason why is a lot of people see themselves in themselves instead of seeing themselves in the light of God's sufficiency of grace. Um, understanding that you'll never add up. You'll never be enough. But God in His grace is enough for you. Uh, when we only see ourselves, what happens is we eventually become hopeless we eventually become helpless. But even in the fact that you come to a point where you feel hopeless and helpless, the, the reason why is because in your hopelessness and helplessness, God is trying to lead you back into His grace because He wants you to live and dwell in His grace. It may sound simple, but sometimes it's very hard uh, to us. We make it complicated. But what we can't comprehend is that God intends to set us free from sin by His grace but what happens many times is we grow so comfortable in our bonds. We grow so comfortable with where we have been for so long that we have this fear of living outside of the bonds that we've lived with for so long. And we sometimes miss the freedom of living in God's grace. There's a story about a, a slave. I was reading about uh, slavery in the 1800s, 1700s, and how horrific that period was for um, uh, you know, African black people. And, but there was a story about uh, when they passed the Emancipation Proclamation and how when that Emancipation Proclamation was passed for a long time, nothing ever happened. That slaves still lived where they lived. They were still in slavery. Uh, the masters didn't really want to let them go because to them they were their property. But finally, the Emancipation Proclamation was realized and it was mandated that you had to free your slaves. And so um, the day the slaves were freed, they called it Juneteenth. And I have no idea why they called it that, but they called it Juneteenth. But there, was, there were some slaves that when they were offered freedom, they kind of balked at it a little bit. They didn't know what to do with freedom. See, they'd never seen it in their whole lives. They'd always been in slavery and in bondage. And so some of them had a hard time with their newfound freedom. There was one guy, his name was W.L. Boast. And he was a slave during this whole time when the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. And he started, he grappled with his newfound freedom. And he explained it. He said, I, he goes, I literally felt like I was a turtle that was poking his head out of his shell. And I had to look around and figure out what it meant to be free. 
and what dangers were lurking out there now that I was free. It was a whole new world to me. He had to understand the lay of the land, so he found his newfound freedom to be scary. And I think in, in some way, when we come into the grace of God, in, in, in some ways it's scary to us, because what does it mean? How, how do we operate now that there's no law? How do we operate now that we kind of have to watch what we get into? And Paul says the reason we watch is because all things aren't edifying for us. All things are lawful, but all things aren't edifying. His newfound freedom was scary, and it can be scary to us too. But the point and, and the reason why God offers grace to us is because through grace and love, we're led to obedience. Because we start to understand that God's grace is just a better way. That God's obedience is just a better way. It's not that we're bound by law, but we now start to realize that inside God's obedience, inside God's law, is love. It's love and it's the better way. In 1 Corinthians 10, 23, I just quoted this. It says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So now, instead of me being bound by law, I now have become a law to myself into the fact that I now watch what I get into. Because it's not that God has forbidden all things, but He knows some things just aren't good for me, and I've come to learn I'm not going to go there. Because it's not edifying to me. It's not edifying to my walk. It's not helping with my love towards God. It's not helping in my walk of grace. So I'm no longer bound by laws, but through grace now, I find something working differently. And I come to this in a realization. I find something at work that I, I can't explain in myself. That now instead of being bound by the law, there's now the law that's written on my heart that when I would go in to do something that I used to do, I find that I can't do it. Or at least I can't do it successfully. I have a hard time doing it. So I find through grace... God writes His law on our hearts. And that's what keeps us from so many things. That's what keeps us from danger. But I'm understanding that through God's grace, that His way is the better way. We have the better way through the grace of God. Max Licato, he said this. He said, grace is the voice that calls us to change, and then it gives us power to pull it off. Think about that. Grace is the voice that calls us to change. We take grace as it's just God calling us to change. But we got to understand that grace goes further, and it gives us the power to pull off the change. John Piper said this. He said, grace is not simply leniency. Because that's what so many people think it is, right? It's just leniency. He says, it's not simply leniency when we've sinned, but grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. Grace is power, not just pardon. That is what sustains us. That is what keeps us. That is what guides us and directs us. It's not just pardon, not just God saying, you know what, I forgive you of everything because he's done that. But him empowering us to now live according to his ways. That's what gives us the power is God's grace. So the question, why, why don't we experience more of God's grace day to day? Because if you think, we, we have been called the fullness of life. Have, hasn't God called us the fullness of life? He said, I'm going to give you life, and I'm going to give you life abundantly. And, and I think sometimes we come to a place where it's like, Lord, this ain't really abundant for me. I, I, it ain't, something isn't adding up to your word. So why isn't it? Why are we not experiencing more of God's grace? Because we always run smack dab into hindrances that cause us and keep us from living in God's complete full grace. So what is it? I'll tell you, there's a couple things that keep us from the fullness of God's grace. And the first one is the belief that God is not completely good. That God is not good in everything that He does. And for a time, we may believe that God is good in this thing. God is good because He did that. God is good because He created the heavens. God is good because He established you know, my, my footing in this business or my whatever it is. But when something else happens, is we come to say, is God really good in this? Is God completely good? Or is he trying to teach me a lesson? Is God trying to punish me? Is God doing something bad to me? You know, we don't understand the fullness of God's goodness that in everything that he does, there's good in it. And there's it's for good. So, Many times in, with this thinking, we find ourselves in spiritual poverty. And we start questioning, why aren't we experiencing fullness? 
He promises to us in John 10.10 that we're going to have life and have it more abundantly. And so why aren't we experiencing that? He gives us life abundantly. Jerry Bridges, he wrote this. He wrote, most of us have a frequent misperception of God as the divine equivalent of Ebenezer Scrooge, demanding the last ounce of work out of his people, then paying them poorly. You know, truly, we, we kind of come to that place, don't we? And nothing's going right. And it seems like we're just scraping by to get the bills paid. And then you get the bills paid and then you get a tax bill. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, this is like an endless cycle. I'm on a hamster wheel here. You know, what's going on? And, and so we start looking at God like he's kind of like Ebenezer Scrooge. But we don't have to look at God like that. Um, whereas some people see him as a cruel taskmaster, we need to see him that God cares about every single detail of your life. That he loves you so much that he cares about and, and, and fine-tunes every detail of your life. There's an old hymn, and I'd never heard this hymn before. And the guy who wrote it is John Newton. And, you know, he also wrote Amazing Grace. But the lyrics to this are, are great, and, and I'd never heard this before. But the lyrics are this. It says, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. For his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. That is a, a man who discovered the fullness of God. That is a man who discovered the, the bountiful riches of God. And that he can never ask too much of God, that God wouldn't supply every need that he has. And Now, we, we don't get into the, the uh, name it and claim it where we say, Lord, I want a red Mercedes and I want it right now. And, and you know, that, that's maybe not what God intends. But when we ask for those things that we truly need, God supplies in abundance. When we honor him with it, especially, he supplies in abundance. And I think John Newton understood that he could never ask God too much, that God wouldn't fulfill or supply. But do we really believe that in our lives? Do we really act like that and walk like that and believe that in our lives every day? Um, do we really rest on God's grace and God's power? I, I have found myself so many times resting on God's power. And I've rediscovered the ability to rest in God's Holy Spirit and His grace. And Nicole's doing this book with Anne Graham Lotz. If you have not read this book, get it and read it. It's Jesus in me, and it talks about the Holy Spirit. But to learn and to trust and to rest in God's grace and power, and that power comes through His Holy Spirit here on earth. But do we rest in His grace? Do we rest in His power? Do we understand the fullness of His grace? And the fact that, you know what, in His grace, we can never ask too much. We, you know, when we grew up with our families, some of our families didn't have a lot growing up. And so you never asked for anything because you knew you just weren't going to get it. So you thought, you know, I'm not going to ask for it. I'm not going to burden my mother and father. They have enough problems of their own. And, and uh, I'll just drum up everything I can. And some of us, uh, Nick's dad is like this. He, he, he scrounges everything he has, you know, and everything's valuable to him. So if he found a coin from 1947, you can bet he still has that coin from 1947. It's hiding away somewhere, but he's got it. And he learned to, to just pack everything he could because you never knew when you're going to have and not have. Um, so sometimes we come to that mentality that we got to hoard because who knows where we're going to get our next meal? Who knows who's going to supply what we need in, in the future? So we got to keep it and, and scrounge for it and, and hang on to it. And, and we start to see God like that. But we need to see God differently. We need to see God that He is full of abundance. He is full of grace. And He wants to pour out upon us because we're His. God will never give too little. And we will never ask for too much. God will never give too little. And we will never ask for too much. We have a tendency to believe that God won't answer our prayers. And we have a tendency to believe that God's grace and power aren't enough to fulfill our needs and requests. But we need to truly understand that God's grace and power are all that we need. And I think, I believe, you know, I have not because I ask not. Many times I just don't ask because I've come to understand maybe I shouldn't ask. And God, God am I burdening you with something that I shouldn't be asking for? But I, we need to start understanding, I need to start understanding that God is sufficient in His grace and His power. And we can never ask too much and He'll never give too little if we look back in Genesis 3, you can see the pattern of this and, the, and the, the temptation of this was proposed to Eve, and it's still given to us every day. It's still a tempt, or we're still tempted with it every day. And, and the temptation was 
to get Eve to believe and to get us to believe that God is not completely good. Here's God. He sets up the Garden of Eden. He makes this beautiful, lush landscape. He makes animals. He makes the perfect scenario, the perfect temperature. You know, everything was perfect. It was paradise. And everything was perfect. And he made one tree. And out of every five trillion trees there probably were in the Garden of Eden, he said, just one tree you don't, don't eat for your own good. But Satan got Eve to believe that, that he was holding, God was holding out, that he wasn't good because he must be keeping something from you. And he still plays this trick on us today, that we think there's something else. There's something beyond the horizon. There's something else we need that God hasn't supplied, and he's holding it from us for some reason. And we're in abject poverty, or we're struggling because God is just not good. And so that's his lie to us. We see the same thing in the book of Job, that Satan attacks Job with the same tactic. And he tries to get Job to believe that God's not good because he wants Job to curse God to his face. And even his wife is used as an instrument, and she comes and says, would you just curse God and die? And Job fortunately says, no, I won't do that. But the trick is the same. He wants to get us to believe that God is not completely good. He wants us to see God as stingy, someone who's reluctant to give us everything we need. But God promises us to give us an abundance of His grace and His power. He has bought us. He has claimed us. We're His. Our lives are His. So He is mindful of the details of our lives. God is just good. God is just good. The second thing that we start to believe is that God is not loving. God is not loving. In Galatians 5, 6, it says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. And if anybody knows circumcision, it was an outward sign that the Israelites were God's people. But the Israelites started to trust in the sign, and they stopped trusting in the God who gave them the sign. And so that's why Paul's writing to the, to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the, the readers of the law, the, the writers of the law, that, you know what, circumcision, uncircumcision doesn't mean anything. That was a sign given by God. God is the focus. And the only thing that matters is faith, which worketh by love. And so we find in God that He is a God of, of love, a God of full of love. And to understand His love, we have to understand His grace. We have to understand why He loves us. We have to understand that He loves us and what it costs to reclaim us in His love. We have to understand the gospel. And we have to keep the gospel ever before us. We can't receive the fullness of God's love until we understand what He did to show us His love. And Satan doesn't want us to understand that fullness. Satan doesn't want us to understand what He did. But the thing about Satan is Satan really doesn't understand the depth of God's love. How can he? Because he hates it. He identifies it. He knows it's out there but he doesn't understand it. And so he fights with everything in him to keep us from understanding the depth of God's love for us. When we start to understand our depravity, then we see God's willingness to love us anyway in spite of our depravity. What happens is through understanding his love, we have a desire to want to become his disciple. You can't become a disciple until you experience His love. You'll never become a disciple until you experience His love. But when we experience His love, everything in us says, I'm leaving all else. I'm abandoning every other way of life, but I'm, I'm becoming now a disciple of Jesus Christ because in Him is everything, and He loves me completely. We get the motivation to become a disciple when we understand and experience God's love. There's nothing else like it. Any other order of things wouldn't work but we have to understand and start with the depth of God's love in our lives. And the return, the, what God gets in return is that we love Him back. Is that we love Him back. And that's what He's wanted. That's what He's always wanted. He loves us, or we love Him because He first loved us. There's an old um, Puritan theologian, and I can't remember his name, but uh, he was from like the 14 or 1500s. And he wrote this. He wrote, The greatest sorrow and burden you can lay on the Father. The greatest unkindness you can do to Him is not to believe that He loves you. It burdens His heart to think that you think 
He doesn't love you. There's a story about a church nearby, and I don't remember if I told this or not, but it's really close. Uh, so the names will remain anonymous. But there was a church nearby, and they were looking for a pastor. And they contacted the, the pulpit supply, what they call pulpit supply in the Baptist Association. And um, they asked for you know, a, a preacher candidate to come and preach for them. And so this preacher came. He was a middle-aged man, Southern Baptist, I think. And he came to preach for them one Sunday, and his message that day was on the miracle of the cross of Jesus Christ. And so he preached, preached boldly, preached good from what I hear, and he preached about the power of the gospel, the power of grace. And the congregation listened intently to him, and they listened to the whole sermon. And as he left, they thanked him, shook his hand, and uh, he went on his way. And then when the pulpit supply person called that church, he said, well, what did you think? He said, do you want me to send him back to interview as a candidate for being your pastor? And they said, no. They said, no, we don't, don't want you to do that. They said, we don't need to hear the gospel because we're already saved. We want something different. And so that man never went back, but they missed the point. They missed the point because we need the gospel every single day day of our lives. We need to be reminded of the gospel every single day of our lives. I quoted Jerry Bridges. I'm going to quote one more by him. He said this. He says, you need to preach the gospel to yourself every day because you need to understand every day that you are under the grace of God. You need to understand the, the penalty that was paid for your sin. You need to understand that freedom was bought for you with a price. When the slaves were freed, they might have still felt like they were in prison. They might have still felt like they were shackled. They might have still felt like they were slaves. But the Emancipation Proclamation changed everything, whether they felt like it or not. They were free. And what they did is they took a, a long rope and they cut it in little pieces. And as they came to their friends, they gave them a piece of the rope. And they said, keep this rope as a reminder that you're no longer in slavery and no longer does the rope bind you but now you hold the rope. And we need to keep the gospel ever before us to understand that we're free. We're free by God's grace. No matter what we feel like, no matter what emotions get the best of us, we are free by God's grace. And we need to be reminded of it every single day. We need to be reminded of God's love and grace every day. And when we understand, and when we live with a sense of God's love for us, then we will love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul we'll have a natural reaction to his love with our own love. In Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, Paul added. I like how he tacked that onto the end, saying that you're quickened in Christ, but by grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. So you've been set free by grace. And you may not feel like it. Some days you may feel as in, in bonds as you ever felt before. But the Emancipation Proclamation of your life has not changed. It's still there. It's still been declared. It's still been posted. And so the gospel has to be set before you. But there is a power by God's grace to overcome. There is love in God's grace that will never change. There's a knowledge that comes with God's grace of God's goodness and that he wants all good things for you and that he is a God of complete goodness and a God of complete love. You and I need to live by God's grace every single day of our lives. Will you stand with me? <clears throat> and as you close your eyes, I just want you to understand how you have been freed, how you have been completely saturated with God's love. That although you may keep record of your own wrongs, you may be hung up on all the little idiosyncrasies in your life. All the times you said something you shouldn't have said, 
all the times you did things that you thought were out of your character. That even all those things have been washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. That God's grace is an endless supply. That it didn't stop the day you sinned too much. That it just keeps going on and on. Because you have been quickened together with Jesus Christ. You can't change the status. You can't go and grab the Emancipation Proclamation and rip it in shreds and say, God, I've done it now. Because that document exists in places that you just can't get to. It's been passed. It's been decreed. His love has been supplied. His goodness has been declared. And your life has been changed forever. He wants you to walk in that grace. He wants you to understand and receive that grace every day. He wants you to live in power through grace. Because without it, out, without it, we have nothing. In yourself, you have nothing. But you truly have everything you need. You truly have every power that you need. In God's grace, Paul said, your grace is sufficient for me. Paul knew that in him he was weak, that he wasn't able to accomplish anything. He knew in himself was sin. But when he rested in the grace of God, he had power to do all things. He had love that carried him through all things. He had a God who was always good. And we have the same thing today. Have you stumbled? Have you fallen? Have you forgotten that you live in the midst of God's grace? Today you need to be reminded that that grace is yours and you have power to live by it, to no longer live defeated. God declared it over you. And Father, we praise you for it. We thank you for it, Lord. Lord, how we could come and sing and shout because of what you've done for us. And forgive us, Lord, where the enemy has lied to us for so long to get us to believe something different. Lord, we choose to believe your word. And your word says that you love us completely, that you are good to us, that you have given us life abundantly. Father, we thank you for it. Help us to live this week that way. Father, lift us up as we lift you up in praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this week.